Hello, YouTube. I am deep into cult research for another Rate My Cult. Please enjoy this Patreon video from a few weeks ago. Hello, Patreon. Y'all get the good stuff. I'm just telling you that right now. So, Occult Russia. I had to read this book for work research. No, I don't work for the CIA. I'm a writer. And because I'm an actual writer, it means I research the real world and I don't just watch stuff and just regurgitate what other people put out like chat GPT. I'm a real writer. Anyway, <laughs> I had to read this book for work. It's called Occult Russia, Pagan, Esoteric, and Mystical Traditions by this man called Christopher McIntosh. Um... If you're interested, you can read the book yourself or you can listen to my 20 minute summaries. I know what I would choose. Now, full disclaimer, this book is about Russian mysticism, but it does address Russian militarism. It explains it, but it does not condemn it. You know, maybe it should have. In no way, as you know, in no way do I support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I hope that Ukrainians continue to defend their lands and destroy the invaders. Just keep in mind, for the longest time, Ukraine and Russia were kind of merged. They were connected. So much of this information applies to both regions. We are not praising Russia here. Okay, we're just understanding it better. Now, Christopher McIntosh is an Oxford-trained historian, and he specializes in esoteric traditions in the West. He also speaks Russian. I found him through an interview on Miguel Connor's channel, Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. I'm always supporting Aeon Bike Gnostic Radio. They're fantastic. And it's a good size book. It's about um, 230 pages. Is this six by nine or seven by 10? You know, it's a good size book. It's not the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but it's not a children's book either. It's a substantial book. It's a solid starter book on Russian mysticism and traditions. I think the most important point that Macintosh makes is that Russia has two side-by-side -side traditions. There's the Orthodox Church, Christianity, and there's also a mystical pagan belief. Also, the Bolsheviks, uh, they really clamped down on nearly all religions. The communists were atheists, or they supposedly believed in communism as an ideology, but really that devolved to believing in power. I talked about this on my YouTube video this week. You got to believe in something or you just believe in power. It's sad. Anyway, the Bolsheviks, they came to power in 1917. There was a civil war. So I like, think 1917 to 1922, they really came to power. And before that, Russia was undergoing a spiritual renaissance, just like the rest of the West was. You have Helena Blavatsky. She was Ukrainian, but she, you know that was Russian at the time. And she founded Theosophy, and that laid the foundation for the New Age. Gurdjieff, we talked about him, and he was Turkish, but he operated in that Russian world. And early on, he had many Russian followers. We remember Gurdjieff from uh, the Fellowship of Friends. We also discussed him in the Free Will video. Now, both of these people, Blavatsky and Gurdjieff, had to teach in Western Europe and the United States because of various upheavals in Russia. Nevertheless, they came from that strong Russian tradition. Also, this is something really interesting I learned, that the Russian language, I knew that the Russian language was a Pi language, which is Proto-Indo-European. So nearly all of the European languages, including English, uh, are Proto-Indo-European languages, or Pi, as we call it. Nom nom pi. Russian is so similar to Sanskrit. And maybe it's because of the similarities between the two languages, or maybe it's to do with the spiritual revivalism of the turn of the last century, one before that. So <laughs> 1800s to 1900s, around the year 1900s. But Russian mystics really played up their relationship to the ancient Indian culture. Now, Macintosh also explains that because the Russian empire covered so much land and they encompassed so many peoples, it has a much deeper indigenous religious tradition than we do here. There are shamans in the steppe. They also border China near Tibet. So you have the Buddhist influence there. Plus they have their old gods, the Russian old gods. Their Zeus is called Rod. Rod means kin or folk. So you see it as a root word in a lot of their other words. Um, I think it's just funny because Rod to us sounds like a mechanic. Anyway, the Russians switched over to Christianity around the year 988. It's about the time that uh, Western Europe also switched over to Christianity, but they still had a lot of those traditions mixed together. Uh, the pagan rituals got repackaged, and they have saints' days that represent the old gods like the Catholics do as well. Now, you may remember Grigory Rasputin, 
He's one of these mystical holy men. You may know him from Disney movies or popular TV shows. He was a Storetsky, meaning he comes from a tradition of mystics and healers, or he came from a tradition before they murdered him. Now, you know that Rasputin was the healer who helped Tsar Nicholas and his wife with their son's hemophilia. Macintosh writes about how Rasputin treated ailments with the human voice. And that's a very modern thing because if you go on YouTube, you see that tones, frequencies, sound healing, it's all the rage now. And he was doing that, you know, over a hundred years ago. Macintosh actually writes about the fall of the Russian empire as a great tragedy. Religious leaders, they thought Stalin was the antichrist. And I really can't imagine anyone who better fits the description than Stalin. Like not only was he a savage person, but he was also an atheist who believed only in power. Many in the, of the characters, many of the characters in this book, unfortunately spent many years or died in the gulag. The lucky ones were able to leave the USSR and practice their traditions in the West. That's one of the reasons that Opensky uh, told people that you have to learn the fourth way through a teacher. You can't learn it on your own. And the knowledge had to be hidden because it wasn't safe to share openly. And under Stalin, it wasn't safe to share knowledge openly. We covered this in the Fellowship of Friends with Gurdjieff, uh, that Rate My Cult, the fourth way. There was somewhat of a thaw under Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. He happened to be Ukrainian. He's played by Steve Buscemi in the brilliant movie, The Death of Stalin. History looks on Khrushchev very, very well. And um, he put an end to a lot of this Stalin era butchery. And he may not have been perfect, certainly wasn't perfect, but people had some form of religious freedom again. People were let out of the work camps. It was, it was a good time. Then uh, religious restrictions, they tightened again under Brezhnev. But then after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, where many of you weren't even born yet, Russians were able to get religious freedom again. Yay! If you haven't seen The Death of Stalin, what are you waiting for? That movie is brilliant. It is brilliant. Now, Macintosh's description of the military worship of the Russian people is really enlightening. Now, since they weren't really allowed religion under the USSR, war memorials kind of became altars to people. People would take wedding photos next to tanks. He speaks of the cult of Lenin, how people go on pilgrimage to see Lenin's body. If you've been following the Russian propaganda since the start of this awful Ukraine war, you'll find things that are similar to this. They think they're carrying out a divine mission. Macintosh points out how uncomfortably close the relationship between the state and the Orthodox Church is. And there's a reason, there's a really good reason why the Ukrainians kicked out the Russian Orthodox Church. And it's nothing to do with religious freedom one way or the other. It's not because they don't support religious freedom. It's because of this incestuous relationship between the Orthodox Church and the Russian state. And this precedes the Ukraine war. Plus there was a schism between the Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox. It's over there news. Let's just consider it over there news. There was a schism over there. But you know what? There are Russian mystics as well. And they're not these militant conspiracy theorists. They've got beliefs in mystical lands and they've got folk healers. They still have shamans, especially now that the USSR has fallen. They even have a resurgence of paganism. And of course, we're not worried about that because they're not bothering anyone. You know, they're just trying to live their life and they're just trying to become spiritually better. And it's a real tragedy that they have to live under this current regime. I hope and pray none of them are sent to the front. That's all I can do. Hope and pray they are not sent to the front. Now, what's really fascinating to me about this book is his complete breakdown of Alexander Dugin. You may know Dugin as Putin's Rasputin. That's what the media calls him. His daughter was recently killed in a car bomb and he framed it as like a sacrifice for their motherland. Just to interject, <laughs> I gotta interject. But why is Russian drama so much better than ours? Our drama is just goofy. It's, it's whatever. So Hunter Biden has a laptop full of pictures of him with hookers and his penis. That's stupid. Putin has his own Rasputin whose daughter was killed in a car bomb. That is tragedy. That is story. That is epic. Our tales, our epic tales, they're lame as hell. Oh, the president got a blowjob. Ugh. George W. can't read. Boring. We used to have good epics. The Kennedys, America's princes, murdered by the CIA. Truman tells Oppenheimer to stuff his guilt. Oh, Lincoln assassinated days before the end of the Great War. This is mythology. This is story. But we are no longer serious people. It's really a good thing that we have guns and war robots uh, because we are so unserious. 
And the fact that we can be so unserious and still be on top is the most satirical story there ever was. Anyway, back to Dugan. <laughs> back to Alexander Dugan, the new Rasputin. This dude has apparently been whispering in Putin's ear. He wrote this book, Dugan, called The Foundations of Geopolitics in 1997, in which he lays out his vision of the world. He posits a planetary conspiracy with two opposing powers. He calls the Anglosphere a sea power, which means that we own the sea and that we're multicultural uh, and that we believe in markets. He says that the West is the new Carthage, even though the U.S. Found, was founded on the image of Rome. He's named us the Atlanticist Empire. It's a great name. Got to give him that. Dugan calls Eurasia a land power because its power is on land and it's politics driven rather than market driven. This is to be led by Russia. Eurasia is to be led by Russia, which he calls the new Rome. Now, we're in the middle of history. We don't know if his vision is true or not. It's obviously a kind of a cyclical view of history combined with this great narrative that puts Russia at the center. Now, very convenient. They get to be the power that wins, huh? Maybe if Russia had invested in its market over its politics, they'd be able to wage a real war right now. But this video is not going to be dunking on the Russian military failures, especially after this week. I just found it interesting. And I don't buy Dugan's theories at all. These people, they think you're Rome. You think you're Rome, kid? You never even had a republic to lose. Anyway, Dugan has led a fantastic life. The best comparison I can think of is Alex Jones, if Alex Jones ever served in Congress. Dugan started off as kind of punk as part of this group called the Yuzinski Circle. I'm butchering that pronunciation. Okay, they tried to shock the establishment by using symbols of the Third Right, which is the USSR's mortal enemy, as well as drinking a lot and having orgies. Now, this was the early 80s. We all had a crazy youth, maybe not that crazy. <laughs> but if you didn't have a crazy youth, you kind of wasted it a little. So I'm not going to hold it against you or Dugan for his punk phase. You know, we all did something. Now, cut forward to the fall of the Soviet Union conspiracy theories running amok this whole time. Not like the West is above conspiracy theories anyway. I'm just saying they had a lot to work with in Russia in the 1980s and 1990s because of what happened. Dugan starts his political party and then he leaves it. He runs for Duma and this pop star throws him a concert dedicated to the memory of Aleister Crowley, known as the Great Beast. Dugan even reads from one of Crowley's works at the concert. Dugan then serves as a high-ranking advisor in the Duma. Let me tell you how much that would never happen here. You ever pack a giant, giant box just full of books just to do it quickly and then you try to lift it? That's how much that would never happen here. Someone holds a concert to a Satanist and gets a job in Congress? No. No. That's what I mean. The Russians are just more interesting. Even Alex Jones is against Satanism. There's no real equivalent to Dugan in the West. And we're supposedly free thinkers. <laughs> I guess we just, we just don't want to worship Satan. We don't want to support this. We don't like Satanism. As a general rule, we don't like Satanism. But to hear the Russians tell it, <laughs> that's all we like. Meanwhile, this dude is praising the original Satanist. Now, all of this made Putin's speech about invading Ukraine make a lot more sense. You know, he spoke in these sweeping terms about a greater Russia. Putin is just part of this epic story. And he probably should have told the Ukrainians because they're not playing their part. Zelensky is a great actor, but he, I guess he didn't know what his sides were. Now it's improv and Zelensky's completely stolen the show. So I got to communicate better. Anyway, then later, <laughs> off of that, later we see this, uh, this narrative as the Russians are the victims, NATO are the aggressors, this is a war for liberation, and Russia is literally dreaming while it's awake. This is really good stuff. I'm here for the show. I just wish they wouldn't commit as many war crimes. Plus, the Russians got this Wagner drama in Bakhmut. It's, it's good TV. Uh, that's like It's like if the U.S. Army were bickering with a mercenary force like Blackwater and the Blackwater dude is giving these speeches in front of the corpses of his fallen soldiers. The drama, the intrigue, the backstabbing. I am so happy people will translate this for me. <laughs> 
I will pop my popcorn and watch it all day knowing that there are oceans between us on either side and I got the Star Wars dome overhead. I'm like, let Ukraine deal with these psychos. I do not want anything to do with them. And if Ukraine does it, we never have to. Not even if a third world war breaks out. See? Think about these things. Anyway, it all makes sense of what Putin was talking about. How Russia has this tradition and have this coherent worldview. Meanwhile, the West is nothing but degradation and death. It's the prevailing narrative of the contrarian sphere online. When I heard Putin's speech saying that it was Russia, not the United States, that has a vision for the world and for the vision of the future, I thought he was nuts. You can check out this week's YouTube and you will see that I am not making any excuses for the spiritual failings of the West. There are none to be made. However, we got good tech. We got nuclear fusion coming. The market is, market is something. It allows people freedom to do what they want, to act as they wish. Don't like what the market has given us? Blame the people. Seriously, blame the people. Basically, what the West has to offer is freedom. Put an asterisk next to freedom there. Please, asterisk. We've got straight white teeth and we got technology. <laughs> Oh, is that not enough? Is that not enough for you? <laughs> your soul may be empty, but your teeth will be sparkling. <laughs> it's crazy. All kidding aside though, all kidding aside though, I do think we are going to beat this scourge of uh, cynicism, of anti-humanism that has been flooding the West. And that's, that's like you and me personally. I know Russia doesn't have any faith in us to do this, Russian propaganda is about how we're satanic and we're anti-family and they've got a point. They do have a point. I'm just saying they don't know us like we know us. Who's your reading from page 226? I'll put this on the board. <laughs> put this on the board. I'll put this on the screen. The combination of heavenly inebriated and earthly sobriety also characterizes another initiative inspired by the cosmist movement, namely the Izborsky Club, a conservative Moscow think tank founded in 2012 by influential people from academia, journalism, politics, business, the church, and the military. An idea of the club's agenda can be obtained by looking at its journal, bearing the same name as the club itself. Central to the group's millenarian scenario as the metaphor of a coming global flood in which Russia will act as an ark to save humanity. You see, I put ha, I put ha in the margins because I put sarcastic remarks in the margins of my books. So if you ever are lucky enough to get a book after me, you will be laughing. They think of themselves as the ark. It's interesting that they have such an apocalyptic undercurrent because we do too. It's like we're twinsies. And anyway, all kidding aside, how are they going to be an ark if they're the land power? They got to read Dugan's book. They don't know how to think about things. The West is a sea power. We won't even notice the next flood. Anyway, but for real, Macintosh's book is really enlightening. Uh, it's great at understanding Russia. I mean, they're still the enemy and they're still actively plotting against us at all times. And they're abusing Ukrainians. I'm not going to leave that out. Nevertheless, it's kind of important to put them into context. I wish Russia weren't so brutal. They weren't so mean in the war because Macintosh really makes them sound like a cool people. The religious and their philosophical traditions, they're deep and they're meaningful, not like our shallow mega churches, which... <laughs> anyway, I hope they find themselves and become a better country. I really do. Maybe there's another Khrushchev waiting, you know, to take over. But I doubt that. I think, I think Putin killed them all. Maybe there's one. I still have hope that maybe there's one out there. Anyway, you should definitely read this book if you like to learn about things for the sake of learning about things. It will not help you in your day-to-day -day life. I mean, what do you care what Russia gets up to? If they get up to too much, we'll give Ukraine more weapons and let the Ukrainians deal with them. That is the extent of our involvement in Russia. <laughs> Thank God. Oh my God. However, if you are interested in this topic, I definitely recommend this book. It really helped me with my work project. And if you, if you so happen to be Russian and you are against Putin and his war, if you just wanna go to the forest and do mushrooms and find Shangri-La, I really wish you the best of luck. Anyway, I'm gonna be doing a lot more of this on my Patreon because 
people have been asking for it. Plus, I'm constantly reading and very rarely do I make videos about the books that I'm reading. But people are always asking me, what are you reading? So I'll just let you know and I'll let you know if it's any good and if it's helpful. I know a lot of you don't have all the time in the world and you don't do research for your work. So I'll do it for you. <laughs> I'll do it for you. Thanks for subscribing, really.